Hey guys, welcome to the second video in this Flutter game development series where we are creating a 2D top-down space shooter called Space Escape using Flame Engine. In the last video, we completed the initial setup for this project. We also saw how to load sprite sheets and display a sprite using sprite component. And in this video, we are going to implement player controller. So let's get started. First, let's move out this code for player sprite creation into its own class. For this, I'll create a new file under game directory called player.dart. In this file, let's create a new class called player which will extend from sprite component. Now let's add a constructor for player and call constructor of base class. And since base class in this case is sprite component, we can provide position, size and sprite to it. So let's add these three parameters to player's constructor. And since all these are optional, I have used the nullable types. Now we can forward these parameters to the constructor of base class. Next, let's go back to game.dart and create an object of player class. For the sprite, position and size, I'll reuse these lines from previous sprite component. And now we can remove the sprite component completely. And that is it. We have now extracted out player into its own component class. So next, let's see how to move the player. For this, I'll go to the player class and add a new field of type vector called move direction. This vector will control the direction in which player is moving. Initial value for this vector will be vector2.0. And to actually move player along this move direction, we'll have to implement the update method. So let's override the update method from base class. Now to move the player, we'll have to modify its position such that it appears to be moving along move direction. Which means we'll have to modify its position per frame of the game. So I'll write this dot position plus equal to move direction dot normalized. Here normalized is needed because we just need to know the general direction in which the player should be headed. To convert it into velocity, we can multiply with a constant speed value. And in addition to this, we'll also have to multiply this with the input delta time, which is nothing but the time elapsed since last update call. Multiplying with delta time ensures that distance traveled by player is same irrespective of the frame rate of the device. Now let's define a value for player speed. For now, I'll set this to 300. But later on, we might change it depending on the type of spaceship selected by players. So to be able to change the move direction of player from outside the class, I'll add a method called set move direction, which will take a new move direction and set it as the current move direction. So this completes the player class for now. Let's go back to game.dart and add code to move player depending on user inputs. User inputs in this case are just touch gestures. So to be able to detect gestures in our game, we can use the mixins provided by Flame Engine. In this particular case, we need the pan detector mixin. But if you check the documentation, you can see that there are a lot of detectors which can be added to any class derived from game class. So the pan detector mixin exposes 5 useful methods. Using these, we can detect the start, update and end of a pan gesture along with the exact coordinates of the touch. Now let's quickly override all these methods so that we can see which method gets called when. I'll add a print statement inside each one of these so that we can see the output in debug console. So now if I click anywhere on the screen once, you can see that the on pan down, on pan start and on pan end method got executed. The next, if I just click and hold, you can see that only on pan down and on pan start got executed. And as soon as I release the click, on pan end also gets executed. And finally, if I click, hold and start dragging the pointer, you can see that the on pan down and on pan start get executed once and then on pan update gets executed for every small movement of the pointer until I let the drag end. You might have noticed that the on pan cancel method did not run for any of the cases. Even I am not 100% sure when this method gets called. But to be safe, we'll treat it same as on pan end. Also, we can see that on pan start and on pan down gets called every single time, so probably we can treat them as same, so I'll remove on pan down. 
Now using these four methods, we have to figure out the direction in which player should be moving. This means we'll have to deal a little bit with vector math. Let me explain this with a diagram. So let's say this is our mobile screen where the game is running. And let's say the user taps and holds on the screen at this location. This is where our on pan start method will get called. And we'll have to store the coordinates of this start point. Then next, let's say the user drags his finger to this new location. This is when the on pan update method will get called. And in that method, we'll have to get the new coordinates of pointer. And once we have both the points, we'll find out a vector from start to end and set it as the new move direction of the player. And similarly, if the user now drags the pointer to a new location, we'll again find out the new move direction using original start point and this new end point. Now that we understand what needs to be done, let's start translating this into code. So in the on pan start, we can get the coordinates of pointer using details.globalPosition. This is of type offset. So I'll add a new field in our game class called pointer start position. And note that I'm making this a nullable type. We'll understand its use later in the render method. Now in the on pan start, I'll store the pointer coordinates in pointer start position. Next in the on pan end and on pan cancel, I'll set the pointer start position to null. In a way, null will indicate that user is not touching the screen. And now in the on pan update, let's first get the current pointer position from details and store it into a local variable called pointer current position. Next, to get a vector starting from pointer start position to pointer current position, I'll just subtract pointer start position from pointer current position. This will be the delta vector. And since pointer start position is nullable, I'll add a not at its end to cast it to a non-nullable dynamically. Now we just have to set this delta as the new move direction for the player. But we don't have a reference to the player object here. So I'll quickly add a new field of type player in the game class. And since I want to keep this field non-nullable and cannot initialize it in the constructor, I'll mark it as late. Now in the onload method, I'll remove this final keyword so that the player gets stored in the player field. And now in the on pan update, we can access the player component and call set move direction on it. And as set move direction needs an object of vector 2, I'll create a new vector using delta.dx and delta.dy. So once we save this, we can move the player by dragging the pointer anywhere on the screen. But you can see that even if I leave the pointer and stop dragging, the player does not stop. This is because we haven't reset the move direction of player once pan gesture ends. So to fix this, I'll set the move direction to vector2.0 in on pan end as well as on pan cancel. Now let's save and do a hot restart to check this. And yes, it seems to be fixed now. Now our basic player controller is ready but in its current state, it does not give any visual feedback to the user. So to improve it, let's add some sort of a virtual joystick. And to draw some circles for the joystick, I'll override the render method in our game class. Here, after calling render method of base class, I'll check if the pointer start position is null or not. If it is not null, it means user is touching the screen. And in that case, I'll draw a circle on the screen using canvas.drawcircle. Draw circle needs three parameters, center, radius and a paint object. I'll set the center as pointer start position and radius as 60. And for the third parameter, I'll provide a paint object with its color property set as colors.gray. Now let's save this and see how it looks in the game. And as you can see, now we get a grey circle at the start point as long as the pan gesture is alive. Having a solid color for virtual joystick is a bad idea because it will then block anything that is being rendered under it. Let's make this circle a little transparent by setting the alpha to 100. Then next, let's try to draw another circle which will display the current position of pointer. For this, we'll have to convert pointer current position into a field of game class just like pointer start position. 
Now I'll just replace pointer current position inside on pan update with this field variable. And similar to pointer start position, I'll set pointer current position to details dot global position in on pan start and null in on pan end and on pan cancel. Now in the render method, after drawing first circle at the pointer start position, I'll check if pointer current position is null or not. If it is not null, I'll draw another circle at pointer current position with radius as 20 and color as white. If I save this, you can see that we get two circles when I touch and start dragging. This almost behaves like a virtual joystick. But the only problem is that the small circle follows the pointer even outside the original big circle. So our next goal is to somehow keep the small circle inside the big circle even when the pointer goes outside the big circle. So to achieve this, I'll again find out the delta vector between pointer current position and pointer start position. And then we can detect if the pointer is outside the big circle by comparing the magnitude of delta vector with radius of big circle. In case delta dot distance is greater than radius of big circle, I'll normalize it and multiply it by radius. This will essentially clamp the magnitude of delta vector to a max value as big as the radius of big circle. This new delta will be with respect to origin. So to get the new delta with respect to pointer start position, I'll add pointer start position here. And for the case when delta dot distance is less than 60, I'll set delta as pointer current position. Now we can use this delta as center point of the second circle. So let's save this and do a hot restart. Now when I try to drag the pointer outside the big circle, the small circle still remains inside the big circle. This seems good enough for me. Now before we forget, let's convert radius of big circle into a final field. Because having such magic numbers all over the code impacts code maintainability. Let's call this one as joystick radius. Now before we end this video, let's do one minor change to improve the usability of this controller. If you look closely, you'll notice that once I start moving the player, there is no way for me to stop it without leaving the joystick. No matter how much I try to bring the small circle closer to the center of big circle, the player still keeps moving. This is not a major bug, but it might become annoying to the players. So this is a common problem that happens with joysticks. And to fix this, joysticks generally have something known as the dead zone. Dead zone is a small region around the idle position of joystick that does not produce any output in games. Which means player movement happens only after the joystick is moved beyond this dead zone. So in our case, in the on pan update, before setting the new move direction for player, I'll just add a check to make sure that the magnitude of delta that we have calculated is greater than 10. If that is not the case, I'll just set the move direction to vector2.0. Now if I check this in the game, you can see that now I am able to stop the spaceship without having to let go of the joystick. Let's extract out this value in a final field called dead zone radius. And this completes our player controller. I hope you enjoyed and were able to follow along. If you missed something, you can get the final code available in a GitHub repository linked in the description. So if you like this video, do hit that like button and maybe consider subscribing for more such content. I hope to see you in the next one.